So let's turn to, because you're a professor of international humanitarian law, but also of international law in general, so you know very well the legal regime, the common legal regime concerning state responsibility, but there are some specific features in relation to uh, IHL violations. So what are those specific features in your views, because we, we teach those specific features in the MOOC, but in your views, and concerning especially, because we studied that in the course, um, attribution, circumstances precluding wrongfulness and legal consequences. Yes, you, you, you're right uh, that uh, uh, the principles of accountability for breaches of IHL uh, are a little bit specific, more specific than what exists in public international law, in general public international law. In fact, uh, we can say that there are uh, two, kind, two kinds of responsibility. There is accountability of a public law actor, state, international organization, even a non-state actor as insurgents. And you have a second kind of responsibility uh, for breaches of IHL, which is a, a criminal individual responsibility. Uh, if uh, I am going to deal, I'm going to address this question uh, in three parts. Uh, firstly, I would like to, to, re, to re recall uh, the features of a classical responsibility of public international law, and then the peculiarities, uh, the specificities of IHL, responsibility of IHL, and I shall uh, close uh, this presentation with uh, the idea of an individual criminal responsibility. Concerning the classical responsibility, as it has been uh, organized in public international law, in fact, uh, you, this responsibility have, has been codified by the International Law Commission. Uh, there, is a, there are draft articles which have been adopted by the ILC, inter, the inter, International Law Commission, in 2001 for state responsibility for internationally wrongful acts. And uh, in 2011, there was another uh, draft articles which were adopted by the ILC and which concerned responsibility of international organizations. And in fact, it's more or less the twin brother, the twin sister, as you like, uh, of the first draft articles which were adopted by the uh, commission, by the uh, International Law Commission uh, in 2001. Well, the features are well known. You need, firstly, a wrongful act. <coughs> uh, this, the conduct should be attributed to a state or an international organization. And uh, what is important to observe in this respect is that the, the responsibility of state agents or international organization agents or officials is the responsibility of people acting qualitate sua. I mean as agents of the state or as officials of an international organization. Uh, if these people act in a private capacity, the wrongful act they could commit are not attributable to the state or the international organization. And that's what I shall explain in one second. That's one of the main differences with uh, international responsibility for uh, 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 grave breaches of IHL. And then uh, I go on with uh, the classical responsibility of public international law. You have also uh, provisions relating to circumstances precluding, precluding wrongfulness and the consequences arising from an internationally wrongful act. I'm not going to enter the details. Don't be... Uh, don't worry about that, uh, of this uh, codification. I would like now to, to address the particular responsibility in the framework of IHL. 
According to the fourth Hague Convention of 1907, Article 3 of this convention, it's in the convention where you find the well-known Hague regulations, Article 3 of the convention, which is quite similar to Article 91 of the first additional protocol, say that, I read, a belligerent party shall be responsible for all acts committed by persons forming part of its armed forces." Unquote. All acts, and you see that the difference with uh, the responsibility, uh, the state responsibility or the, the uh, international organization, the institutional uh, responsibility, because as I said a few minutes ago, uh, in this case, uh, state responsibility or institutional res responsibility is engaged only if the agent or the official has acted in, its, in his or her official capacity and not if he has acted in his, in, uh, in his private uh, capacity, in his private life. And that's different precisely with IHL because in IHL, you see, uh, there is a kind of, uh, I would say, uh, objective responsibility. In fact, the responsibility of the state or of the, uh, the, the public authority on the subordinates, on the armed forces, I like to make this comparison. It's a little bit like, a little bit like in, the, in the civil code, the responsibility of the master for the beast, for the dogs, <laughs> which is under its guard. <laughs> I say that it should be, it could, it could seem a little bit shocking, but that, that's a little bit this kind of responsibility. In fact, all acts, I repeat, all acts committed by members of the armed forces of a state or of uh, an armed group, an, uh, an organized armed groups uh, can uh, engage responsibility, even if these acts have been committed in a completely private capacity. It's not the same with classic uh, international responsibility. Uh, as I just said, uh, responsibility uh, for IHL breaches can be extended to armed, to organized armed groups but this kind of responsibility has not yet been codified by the International Law Commission. It's just uh, something which is possible because you have a number of, resolu of resolutions of the Security Council which condemn, namely, uh, armed, uh, organized armed groups. So you see that organized armed group can have uh, an international responsibility, even if it remains quite theoretical, except in the case which is provided for in Article 10 of the uh, draft articles of the International Law Commission, uh, in, the, in case when uh, uh, an armed group, uh, an insurgents, for instance, rebels, become the new leaders of a state, the new ruler of a state, and then the responsibility for the wrongful act they would have committed during the conflict could be then attributed to the state because they have become the, 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 the leaders of the state. And the third kind of responsibility uh, I would like to address is, as I said, uh, the individual criminal responsibility, which uh, can be uh, drawn from a grave breach, a grave uh, IHL breach. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, uh, interrupt you, I just interrupt you uh, about uh, this, this, this responsibility because at, at the beginning of the, of the, um, the, the teaching about uh, state responsibility, we clearly say that there's a, a distinction 
I think uh, that's, uh, you're on the same line, this a clear distinction between state responsibility with different legal consequences and individual criminal responsibility. Uh, but of course, the two types of responsibility may be engaged in case of armed conflict, of yes. course, but theoretically uh, there, are, there are distinct kind of responsibility. Do, do you agree with, with that? Yes, uh, 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 absolutely, but, but uh, you must not forget that uh, just uh, next to the, to the state responsibility or the in institutional responsibility, there is also this individual responsibility, uh, the origins of which uh, date back to 1863 uh, to the Liber Code, which was uh, adopted during the, uh, the, the war, the American Civil War uh, at the time. And the, the, first, uh, the first provision which was adopted concerning international criminal responsibility for violations of IHL dates back, dates back to 1906 with the convention, the Geneva Conventions for the Amelioration of the Condition of the Wounded and Sick in Armed Forces in the Field, uh, with Article 28, which was a, a, a quite a small uh, provision concerning its extension, its, uh, uh, its field of application. Uh, the states were obliged at the time to criminalize looting or plundering, uh, ill treatment of wounded and sick, and abuse or improper use or misuse of the Red Cross uh, uh, sign. Then you have uh, in the Versailles Treaty, you have Article 28, uh, 228, which allows state parties to prosecute uh, perpetrators of war crimes. And then you have the charters of the uh, Nuremberg uh, Tribunal and the Tokyo Tribunal in 1945 and 1946. Today, the present sources of uh, this international criminal responsibility for war crimes uh, can be found in common article of the Four Geneva Convention, there was uh, an article which is more or less similar in the Four Geneva Conventions. You have also Article 85 uh, of the first additional protocol and also Article 11 of, this, of the first additional protocol. And you have, most especially today, uh, the statutes of the ICTs, of the the International Criminal Tribunals, and uh, in particular the, sta the Rome Statute uh, of the ICC, uh, Article 8, which is in itself a real codification of uh, the uh, criminalization of war crimes uh, in, the, in the Rome uh, Statute. Uh, we, we, you must keep in mind that uh, till maybe the, the adoption of the statutes of the international criminal tribunals, uh, war crimes conf were confined by states only to grave breaches of Geneva law and not breaches of the Hague law. In other words, breaches committed uh, against uh, people who don't fight, uh, who are uh, wounded, who are sick, who are prisoners, who are internees, and not grave breaches of the law applicable during the conduct of hostilities. These rules were adopted in 1949, four years after the end of the Second World War, which of course uh, you had a lot of gross violations of IHL which were committed uh, more especially, uh, not only by Germany and, and Japan, but, but also by uh, the Allied powers. Eh? If you think of the bombings which were committed uh, on Germany and uh, on, uh, on Japan, uh, uh, where you have a lot of civilians who are victims of these bombings, you understand that in fact, at the time in 1949, uh, the codification uh, of war crimes uh, confined just to uh, violations of Geneva law and nothing about 
violations of the Hague law. And today it's different, uh, and uh, I think that the ICC statute, in, in, uh, as more especially uh, Article 8 of the ICC statute, is a kind of full codification of uh, war crimes, and it's, uh, we can say that it, it's a real progress because not only you find not only violations of uh, Geneva law, but also violations of, uh, uh, of the Hague law, which was already present in, the, in Article 85 of the first additional protocol. But it's more complete in, the, in Article 8. Furthermore, uh, since uh, in Article 8, you have not only war crimes committed during an international armed conflict, but also in a non-international armed conflict. Don't forget that Article 85 of the first Additional Protocol, which was adopted in 1977, uh, it was only confined to international armed conflict. And the things changed only in the 90s. I think that, uh, thing that which must be said, which is very important, is that uh, Belgium was the first state to criminalize grave breaches of IHL committed in a non-international armed conflict. Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, in uh, our 1993 law concerning uh, the uh, suppression of uh, violations of IHL that we introduced, and we were the first state to do that uh, in the world, to introduce uh, the criminalization of war crimes committed not only in international armed conflict, but also in internal conflict, in civil strife. And that it was followed uh, a little bit later by uh, the well-known uh, Tedich judgment uh, given by uh, the ICTY in 1995. And in this judgment, there was a reference to the Belgian law. Mm -hmm. OK. So thanks for, the, for this information and, and thanks for this introductory uh, teaching about international criminal law and individual criminal responsibility because it will be the chapter after this chapter so you gave the, the general uh, uh, knowledge and, uh, and, and this specific reference to Belgium. It is really interesting. We have a Belgium representative here in, the, in, the, in this interview. So I would like to thank you very much, very much to, uh, for, this, for this interview, for this very interesting uh, answer, developments uh, from different perspectives. And uh, we'll wait the, the students maybe to react on the forum uh, on, your, on this interview and to, to fill the, the survey because there is a survey after this, this interview. So thanks a lot.